everyone. Welcome to New Techniques, Same GMOs. I am so honored to be hosting this panel here today in partnership with the Non-GMO Project. My name is Rachel Parent. I'm a youth food and climate activist from Toronto, Ontario. And I am so excited to be here with such an incredible panel speaking about our food systems, health, biodiversity, and science. Today, we'll be diving a little bit more into the discussion of GMOs and even newer techniques like gene editing, asking the real questions that need to be asked and hearing from experts in the field. Today, I'm joined by Claire Robinson, Dr. Michael Antonio, Jim Thomas, Dr. Vandana Shiva, Jonathan Latham, and Megan Westgate. I'm gonna to jump to the panelists now and ask for a quick introduction before we jump straight into questions, uh, starting with Claire, if that's okay. Yes, hi everyone, I'm Claire Robinson. I'm editor at GM Watch, which is a website which tries to keep the public informed about issues around GM crops and foods and their associated pesticides. Yes, so I'm Dr. Michael Antonio. I head a group at one of um, the major universities in London and I use a full spectrum of genetic engineering technologies, including gene editing, to address uh, clinical, uh, for clinical uses. Next, we'll jump to Jim. Hello, thank you very much, uh, Rachel and the Non-GMO Project for this. Um, my name's Jim Thomas. I'm with a collective called the Etc Group. We're a small international research group, advocacy group. We track new technologies and also what corporations are up to, particularly around the food system, um, and try and understand uh, how those are gonna impact the rights of farmers, of indigenous peoples, uh, biodiversity, and so forth. That's great. Uh, next, we'll jump to Dr. Vandana Shiva. I'm uh, Vandana Shiva, originally trained as a physicist. I got into agriculture and seeds and GMOs, including the new GMOs because of the way the Green Revolution devastated the state of Punjab and did the book on the Green Revolution. And my journey on the GMOs began with a meeting organized by the Ag Foundation and, and, uh, uh, in 1987, where the companies laid out their, their view of uh, why genetic engineering was the only way for them to get to patenting. Genetic engineering, old and new, has no other objective than owning life and controlling life and extracting rents and royalties from people. That's wonderful. Thank you. And we'll jump to Megan Westgate now. Thank you. I'm Megan Westgate. I'm the executive director of the Non-GMO Project. And the Non-GMO Project is a nonprofit organization that um, oversees North America's only third party standard for GMO avoidance. So I've been doing this work for about 14 years and my involvement began when I was working at a small food co-op in Tucson, Arizona. And as a shopper myself and watching our, um, our member owners coming in and, and shopping and looking for products, just saw how much confusion there was from people who were looking to avoid GMOs and didn't have a way to do that. So what we've done with the non-GMO project is created a rigorous testing based standard and we currently have more than 60,000 verified products in that are sold in um, the US and Canada. And so our mission really is to empower people to have an informed choice about what they eat and to preserve a non-GMO food supply for future generations. So uh, my name is Jonathan Latham. I am a molecular biologist and a virologist by training. Uh, I am also the co-founder of a nonprofit called the Bioscience Resource Project, which also is the publisher of the Independent Science News website, which covers science of food and agriculture. The entire goal of this panel today is to make sure that this information is as easily accessible as possible because we are talking about scientific issues, but at the end of the day, these issues are affecting every single one of us. They're affecting our food, our climate, and our entire uh, system that is yet to come. And the first question that I'd like to tackle today really is, what is the difference between gene editing and traditional GMOs? Uh, so I'd like to jump to Jonathan Latham first to answer this question. Uh, well, you know, that's a, not a simple question to answer, actually. But um, in the case of these new GMOs, gene-edited crops, there is a mixed bag of methodologies that people use. So just to describe CRISPR. So CRISPR is the 
uh, the one that a Nobel Prize has won for the other day. That is the most discussed version of gene editing. And uh, the way that CRISPR works is that molecules are injected into living cells, one of which is a RNA molecule that finds a target in the genome, and the other is a protein that cuts DNA at the site of the target. So that is the theory. And, but the devil is in the details, right? It's what is added to the cell, uh, the, in what form is it added? Is it added as DNA? Is it added as protein? Is it added as uh, RNA? And then the whole host of questions of what follows from that. Like, for example, are there off-target effects and so forth? So, so what you really have to understand is that the term editing is kind of a PR term for what is going on. It's kind of a nice description of what is really quite a messy topic. Absolutely, and uh, it can get pretty messy and that's why we need to have these discussions that are very open and understanding. Uh, I saw Megan put her hand up quickly. Uh, we'll jump to you next. I just wanted to say that broadly, a less nuanced way of answering it is that they are they're all types of in vitro nucleic acid techniques. So I know we're trying to understand what some of the nuances are, but I think it's also important to name right at the outset that there are fundamental things that are not different. It's all biotechnology, it's all genetic engineering, the products are GMOs. So in the non-GMO project standard, for example, we use the same definition of biotechnology that's used in the Cartagena protocol and in Codex, and it makes quite clear that all of these techniques are types of um, genetic engineering that create GMOs, and that's why we don't allow any of them in our standard. Um, and as John said, there, there are quite a number of varieties of techniques that fall under this umbrella. Well, I, th I think something that both um, Megan and Jonathan emphasizes is really good to point to that um, <clears throat> these are all varieties of genetic engineering. Um, the, the kind of old fashioned, if you like, genetic engineering that's been around since the 1970s was broadly a couple of techniques, really two main techniques for cutting bits of DNA out of an organism and moving it across, sort of cut and paste. And that gene editing is one of a number of different genetic engineering techniques that have come along more recently, where you go in and you cut and you add extra things in a different way. But um, it's really more important to the industry, the biotech industry, to try and make these seem like different things. Um, because they're trying to get around some of the regulations and certainly the consumer concern. And the way they're doing it is by trying to create distance between the old genetic engineering techniques and the new genetic engineering techniques. Actually, it's still genetic engineering. So I just wanted to um, you know, em further emphasize uh, what others have said very well, and that is that gene editing is a genetic modification procedure and therefore, by definition, gives rise to genetically modified organisms or, or GMOs. And the, the, um, the claim, as, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, of the gene editors is that unlike the old style, what we call gene addition transgenic GMOs that have been on the market since the 90s, is that they, they introduce a foreign gene cassette into the organism it could be a plant or animal and but the procedure is 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 random you know there's no control of where the foreign gene is inserted whereas the claim of the uh, or what can happen through gene editing is that the the genetic modification that you're introducing is um is supposed to be targeted Hence the term that they're using editing to give the idea of precision in terms of predict and predictability, predictability in terms of the outcome. But only certain uh, aspects of, uh, of the gene editing procedure um, result in, n at least there's no intention, let's put it this way. The, only, uh, only some of the outcomes from gene editing have the intention of not introducing foreign genetic material into the organism, but modifying the genetic material of the organism that's there, changing gene function 
that's already there rather than introducing a new foreign gene function. So this is an, uh, another distinction uh, of, 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 uh, between the two. And I don't know whether, but as, as Jonathan uh, implied quite clearly, that the there, are, there are many ways where this procedure of, of uh, producing only the intended change can go wrong. Many and many different ways in which it can go wrong, and therefore makes the whole claim of precision highly questionable. Maybe we can come back to that later. And also, I think what we have to remember is that you can use gene editing to insert foreign genes, mm. can't you? Um, so this distinction that the industry tries to draw between old style GM, where you're inserting foreign genes, and gene editing, where you supposedly are just tweaking genes that are already there, is actually false. I see this uh, distinction made all the time. You can use gene editing to insert foreign genes, mm. and also you can use gene editing and unintentionally insert a foreign gene. So um, a number of things can go wrong. So that leads me to my next question of what the concerns are with gene editing. And we've heard a lot about the concerns surrounding GMOs, whether that be biosafety, whether that be uh, affecting biodiversity, um, environmental health concerns, whether the sci uh, science itself is sound. And I guess that leads me to asking, what do you believe the concerns around gene editing and traditional GMOs would be? That's to me, is it, Richard? Yes. <laughs> Certainly, thank you. Um, there are um, basically the, the, the unintended effects that can happen from gene editing are, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, it, well, with using the CRISPR gene editing tool as an illustration, the idea is that you, you target a genetic modification. Now, the, the initial step in the vast majority, the, the CRISPR system has been adapted for a number uh, in a, to bring about genetic alterations in a, uh, of different types. But in the vast majority of cases and how it is intended to be used in agriculture, the, the gene editing tool like CRISPR is that it produces, a, a, first of all, it produces a cut. It breaks the DNA at, a pre at your predetermined location, what we call a double strand DNA break. And however, the, and then the editing happens after that not because the gene editing tool does it, by the way. The editing happens as a result of activating the cell's DNA repair mechanisms. Yeah. So after the gene editing tool has actually finished its task, is when the edit. So the editing takes place. So when you hear in the media, or whatever, oh CRISPR does this, edits this, does that. Actually, CRISPR isn't doing anything like that at all. All it's doing is cutting the DNA, and then you're at the mercy of the cell's DNA repair mechanisms to try to bring about what you intend in terms of the actual edit to the DNA. But the, but the, the thing about the, the, the targeting of the cut is that there are a number of unintended outcomes. First of all, the CRISPR tool may cut the DNA of the organism at unintended locations, what are known as off-target cuts. And to date, the emphasis has been on, and this is what you hear people in an agricultural context say, if we can simply avoid these off-target cuts in the genome of the plant, then we'll only get what we want, and therefore there's nothing to worry about. But actually, what's ha what has been discovered in more recent years is that there are numerous types of unintended mutations, even at the intended gene editing event large deletions, large rearrangements of DNA that can affect the functioning of multiple genes. What does that mean? Affect altering the pattern of gene function means you alter the plant biochemistry, and as a consequence of altering the plant biochemistry, you run the high risk, in my opinion, of producing novel toxins and allergens. So this, for me, uh, is really for, uh, the, the, the primary health concerns for me and which when you take these, these, thing, uh, these outcomes, it both off-target and on unintended on-target mutations, the claims of precision and predictability go out the window. I, I think it's important to, it's, it's really great 
to hear and we'll hear more about i think the the sort of unintended impacts of uh of cutting manipulating and disrupting at this genetic level which is involved here i think it's also worth just keeping in the frame the intended impacts um you know what this is about just as gmos the first generation of gmos were about was a very deliberate intention by large agribusiness players um to to reshape our global food system um, and we saw that with the first genetically modified organisms, which were very intentionally about letting large chemical companies take control of our food system. We heard about Monsanto and Syngenta and so forth. Um, and they did so very successfully. Whether the technology worked or not, it definitely worked in building the power of these, these large corporate players in the food system. Gene editing is, uh, is, is part of the same and more. Um, it, uh, what we're seeing now is some of those same multi-billion dollar players who, and there's now only four of them in, in the agribusiness sector, it's, it's Bayer, it's Corteva, it's Syngenta and BASF, um, are being joined by multi-trillion dollar companies, the, the big data giants, the, uh, the machinery companies like John Deere, um, in an entirely new vision for the food system, um, in which they're once again using this technology, uh, CRISPR technology, and, and other gene editing technologies to try and gain control over not just food, but biodiversity and life more generally. So there's a very clear way in which just as they tried to use GMOs to reshape the food system, they're now using the gene editing technology with other digital technologies to, to reshape the food system and how we do things like conservation. And it's, it's a massive power grab. So that's the intended effect. And we mustn't lose sight of that. I think three quick things on, uh, on the regulation issue. The European Court of Justice ruled that gene edited organisms are GMOs and need to be, go through all the biosafety that any GMO has to be regulated through. If we watch the Brexit debate on the new farm bill where they sneaked in gene edited crops for deregulation and there was an outrage and basically the house of lords is as good as struck down those clauses but the government will try and override the u.s has decided to treat gene edited crops as natural and this is the interesting thing that around the time i mean this is a very young tool and its birth of course is, is what got the nobel prize for, Eman, uh, for Emmanuel and Jennifer Doudna. Now, Jennifer Doudna has been funded in a big way by Bill Gates, but so has the Broad Institute in Cambridge. And then there were massive patent battles between Doudna and Zhang. And the interesting thing about the Nobel is it is not given by biology. It is not given for medicine. We, you know, medicine is where the biology discoveries go. This is given for chemistry. So in effect, they're admitting what Michael was saying. This is only about adding some molecules. It is not about being able to make life. Now, not only are there massive patents, if you look at the first company that used gene editing with false claims that they were making low trans fat soya bean, when the trans fat comes from the solvent extraction process and the hydrogenation process of oil, they have 76 patents on CRISPR and, and 178 patents on the talent technique of gene editing. Uh, it's all a patent race. When you realize how just throwing the light makes them withdraw, the company that make, made the, um, the canola, the minute John Fagan and his team did the new tests that showed that even one editing could be tested for, they suddenly went underground because their claim of being natural did not hold. The final thing I want to say quickly, is actually Bill Gates and other billionaires and all the billionaires are in this game of gene editing. They've invested 120 million in a, in a new company called Editas, founded by Feng Zhang, 
of the Broad Institute and all of Silicon Valley is in it, as is the person who used to be the Gates Science Advisor, who has Boris Nikolic, who has a company book called BNGO, which is Bio Nano Geno. Now, all of the tech barons have started new companies on life sciences. And there is this big rush to pretend that you're doing something new. And that, I think, is what we should discuss. That the, the scrambling of the tree of life, scrambling of the sophisticated self-organization of a genome is not doing anything except scrambling. And that's why you have the unintended side effects. Um, and I think it's that big picture of where is the economic interest, the commercial interest, and what are the ethical and ecological implications of pretending it's a precise technology and they've invented life itself all over again. Uh, these are the issue, issues that every citizen should be following. Amazing, and next I'll jump to Jonathan to answer the question. So, so they, you know, I want to go into the genome scrambling issue that that Vandana has raised, because it also extends what Michael raised at the beginning, which is that when you insert these molecules into cells, you don't actually know what you're putting into those cells, in the, in basically in every case. And what we wrote about recently is how researchers have shown that when you add these molecules that do your editing, you also end up adding a lot of other material from other species. And that material gets ended up being inserted into the genome of the organism that you think you are precisely editing. So we showed that when you have a cow genome or a mouse genome, for example, you can end up adding cow DNA to the mouse genome, goat DNA to the mouse genome, E. coli DNA to the mouse genome. So all of these things have been shown to happen in gene editing methods. And so what, my, what Michael emphasizes about the lack of precision in terms of you know, where the enzymes cut and where the targeting happens and what happens after that cutting process, so all of that has to be added this whole other level of confusion and basically scrambling, as Van Dunne says, of the genome that essentially is going flying under the radar because people are not looking properly for these things. And this is very concerning to me. Absolutely, and I'll jump to Jim Thomas next. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really helpful to point this stuff out. I mean, it's it's really ironic that the um, the Nobel Prize, which was which is endowed by um, the inventor of dynamite, Alfred Nobel, is now being given to some people who designed a technique that's basically the TNT of DNA. It's, you know, it's throwing dynamite into the web of life. This kind of scrambling um, of the web of life that's happening, whether at the genetic level by this kind of random uh, scrambling that's happening, or more significantly as this technology uh, um, is employed, and we'll talk later about gene drives, this technology will, both through industrial agriculture and through specific techniques such as gene drives, really disturb and, and, and break apart the web of life. Uh, we had Vandana talking about the tree of life earlier. Um, it, it's kind of ironic that that's, you know, there's this link straight through from the old dynamite to this new genetic dynamite. Absolutely. And it, that brings me to the next question. These foods could potentially be reaching our markets or may already be on our markets. And that's what I'd like to clear up next. Uh, what are examples of food that are already being experimented with? Where can people find it on the marketplace? There are two main uh, gene edited crops that are on the market at the moment. Now, one of these has recently been disavowed by its developer. Um, Cebus says that it's uh, gene edited um, herbicide tolerant canola is in fact not gene edited after all and they said this as has been mentioned before as soon as a detection method was found for it. Um, so that's still a kind of ongoing debate however we can say that Cebus has claimed for many many years that this canola is indeed gene edited so we'll see what comes of that. Um, there's also a soybean uh, made by Calix which has an altered fat profile. 
and um, they've altered the fats in order that it doesn't produce uh, trans fats, dangerous trans fats during the, um, the process by which they, they make various industrial foods. Um, so this we consider to be uh, not exactly a, a crop that is important in feeding the world or solving any kind of problem. It's basically um, a, a crop that is created for industrial needs, the making of junk food. And uh, the other one is, is, is canola, which is herbicide tolerant and will enable more herbicide to be sprayed on that crop. And therefore, it's very much um, in the old tradition of GMOs that don't benefit the consumer, don't benefit the farmer necessarily, but they simply benefit an industrialized food system that isn't particularly healthy to, to begin with. And it's just propping that system up. Just to sh share some perspective of how we look at this in the non-GMO project. So um, because of the proliferation of these new te techniques, um, we actually have two full-time researchers on staff who a large part of what they're doing is watching the new, the explosion of biotech companies, because that's incredible to see um, just for some context on that seen in the last few years a 250% increase in the number of different companies doing biotech. Um, as others have pointed to, there's a lot of money in this and a lot of incentive to play in this space. So we now have over 400 companies that we're tracking on an ongoing basis to see what are they developing. A lot of different inputs, everything from different proteins, fragrances, flavors, um, it, it just covers the whole gamut. But in terms of things that are actually commercially available, those we reflect in the non-GMO project standard, which is publicly available. And we have a high risk list at the end of the standard that identifies um, all of the things that are widely commercially available in GMO form and that we therefore consider to be high risk. And where possible, where the testing technology is available, we require testing of those things. But increasingly, we're having to track items that we don't yet have um, commercially available tests for. And we use um, other mechanisms, mainly affidavits, um, to continue keeping those inputs out of our program. And, and so the crops that are on our list right now, as Claire said, we're, we're, um, we've got soy and canola on there. Um, and also potato, which is developed with RNA interference. And um, that, depending on your definition of gene editing, may or may not fall in this discussion, but just to note that it is something that is not um, currently testable. And so we do track it with other mechanisms to make sure that it doesn't get used in non-GMO project verified products. Um, but just the increased focus on this when the, when the project started, 14 years ago, the list of things we were watching was relatively small and it's just, I can't emphasize enough what a sea change it is happening right now in terms of the increase in development of how many crops and inputs are being impacted. And as a standard setting organization that has accountability for ensuring public trust and making sure that these inputs are staying out of products with the butterfly, our job has gotten way harder. I mean, we're up for the we're doing it, but it's incredibly complicated now compared to even a few years ago. And that even points out the amount of corporate control of our food system and the amount of patents that continue to go up. It's a wonderful profit uh, scheme for a lot of these corporations, but it does make the work of those who are trying to eat healthier or avoid GMOs much more difficult. And then the question arises, is patenting food even something that's ethical or moral is patenting things that are already out in nature, animals, plants, um, something that should be done. And that's where I'd like to ask the question, uh, should corporations be allowed to patent food? What are the scientific assumptions that are making in terms of genetically modifying the food that we're eating? And I'll jump to Vandana. Yeah, so the, first of all, the assumption that uh, you can patent anything derived from a living organism or the organism itself is based on an ontological flaw that a living organism is not living. It is just an assemblage and it's an assemblage put together from outside. 
Now, this has been the subject of many cases. Uh, I've had to deal with it in India. Uh, there was a US case where a farmer called Bauman lost against Monsanto, where the Supreme Court of the US ruled that a seed is a self-replicating machine. The very famous case of Percy Spicer, whose farms, farm was contaminated, there's now a new film out on Percy. But I think it's extremely important to go back to the roots of A, the reductionism, that life is just a collection of atoms and uh, or atoms of determinism, and that is as a machine made through tools of genetic engineering or you know, old or new can be patented. Most people don't remember that the word gene was created long before the DNA strands were actually worked out. And it was created by the Rockefeller Foundation and their associates to hide eugenics. The name used to be social psychology. And it was about control. It was really about eugenics. And Lily Kay, in her molecular vision of life, has not just gone through how this construction of reductionism was created, but that is then the foundation of pretending to have invented and owned. But from 1953 onwards, and I think for Michael, this was, you know, he'd have a lot to say, all but one Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine was awarded to research sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. So we should look at how the Nobel Prize to Duda, sponsored by the Gates, we should be ready. There have been many Nobel Prizes now related to this gene editing. So the idea of patenting was introduced in the WTO trips. We fought it, we stopped it, and we, we created exceptions because life is not an invention. Indian law says plants, animals, seeds, and anything derived from there are not invention and therefore cannot be patentable. And it's a very foundational shift in our thinking because just at the time where we need to recover our ability to think of life in its self-organizing capacity, life in its diversity, that is precisely the time this idea of owning life and owning food is being imposed through all kinds of literal scams. And it costs farmers. Monsanto didn't have a patent, but it extracted money and pushed farmers to suicide. So it can make farmers lose lives. It destroys businesses. But the kind of power that comes with patenting, that's how Monsanto became so big as a seed player. But that's how the tech giants through patents on software are now driving the patents on gene editing. And that's where the editor's company fits in. It's designed to have patents on editing of life itself. And life, I always say, but life is not a software program and it's not a word program. It is a sophisticated, complex self-organizing system. And as Michael said so clearly, what is really happening is the healing capacity and repairing capacity of the organism itself. The shooting is happening through the new gene editing as it was happening through the old gene editing with gene guns and agrobacteria. So it's a, it's a scandal to try and pretend that you have created life and food which is an embodiment of life. And this, you know, this is what has been my dedication now for the last 33 years, but this is what the world should be waking up to. This is what we need to address if there's going to be a future and there's going to be freedom. And I would just mention uh, that I have a book called Oneness Versus One Percent, which tracks some of it, but more importantly, with Claire's contribution, Michael's contribution, and Jim's contribution, and Jonathan's contribution, uh, and many others who are engaged in different parts, we are bringing out a report on what is the state of the world and what's the state of the philanthropists on the 14th of this month. And we should build from this discussion to building a much longer, large, larger right to freedom of having safe food, right of the seed, to not be patented, rights of farmers to save exchange seed, rights of consumers to not be cheated. I, I just think something that Van Danish said there is really worth underlining that the role of the tech companies in pushing this technology 
Um, and I think this is maybe surprising to those who are used to thinking about genetic engineering as being uh, Monsanto or seed companies and so forth. Um, you know, the, the, this technology, whether it's gene editing or the broader area of what's called synthetic biology, is seen as a digital technology. Underlying it is this idea, as, as Vandana says, that it's, uh, you know, the, the seed is a machine, it can be programmed at the level of the genetic level, and this is the way you're going to do the programming. And, um, and when you look across, of course, the tech companies are interested. They are the most powerful, cash-rich um, players in the world right now. They're multi-trillion dollar companies. They're looking for places to put their cash. And if they look at the food system, the food system is somewhere between eight and $10 trillion. It's maybe about a fifth of the global economy. Um, if they can find a set of techniques backed by patents that let them get in and become major players over food, which everybody buys every day, um, and people depend upon, and that life depends upon, of course they're going to do that. That's what's going on at the moment. Jonathan, I'll jump to you quickly. Hi, I just want to say a word in support of what Vandana just said in terms of biology, right? We, we have this habit of reducing life to DNA, you know, in our conversation and so forth in our scientific thinking. And I totally want to express my support the Vandana's idea that life is so much more than DNA. Self cells and organisms are self-organizing systems, and they are not reducible to DNA, but that doesn't mean that you can't make a horrible mess of them by changing their DNA, right? But what it does mean is that you can't just add new traits to organisms and expect that that's simply going to happen at your whim and wish. And so what's going to happen with this new gene editing technology is people are going to attempt all kinds of bold and interesting procedures and, and aim for all these bold and exciting results. But what they're going to end up with time and again is messes. And this is what happened with the first gen generation of genetic engineering. As soon as people try to do anything more than the most simplest basic change of adding a toxin, for example, to a cell, to a, to a species, to a crop plant, they ended up by basically failing to do what they wanted to do because they bought into this whole ideology of just change the DNA and you can alter the organism and you control life and so on and so forth. And that whole ideology is not correct. Biologically, it is totally false and falsifiable. So I really want to say that, you know, Bandon is not a molecular biologist and it, what she says, may sound outlandish to people, but really it's biologically entirely correct. I think now would be a great time to get into some of the things that corporations have told us that simply aren't true. Uh, we've constantly been told that GMOs and gene editing are the answer for feeding the world. And now in more recent months, we've been told that gene editing is the solution for climate change uh, and will help to actually preserve biodiversity. What causes these claims to fall short and what is the actual truth that we're not being told by these big corporations? And I'll jump to Claire first. Thank you. Yeah, the claim about GM going to feed the world and now gene editing is going to feed the world and save us all from climate change is complete nonsense. Um, the problem with this claim is really that there is no shortage of food production. We currently produce enough food to feed up to 14 billion people. And that's according to experts that advise the World Bank Institute. Um, that's more food than we will ever need, even at peak population in 2050. So we're producing huge amounts of food and that even applies to the countries where people go hungry. Uh, there is a lot of food that is produced, but a lot of it goes to waste because there are no storage facilities or no infrastructure to get it to the people who need it. Um, overwhelmingly, the major cause of hunger is poverty and also political unrest. Wherever there are wars or big displacements of people or natural disasters, you get famines. Um, and also there's the fact that in the West, in the affluent countries, we're actually throwing away 40% of our food. So food waste is a huge problem in all countries, in fact. So really, we don't need to produce more food. 
And even if we did, GM does not create higher yields. There is no GM gene for high yield. Uh, high yield is due to a mixture of things, including background genetics of the crops. Um, that's a product of conventional breeding. And also how you treat the soil, um, what kind of weather conditions you've got, how good a farmer you are. All these things go, go into producing good yields of crops. So um, this is even admitted by proponents of GM, such as the, the US government. Even they say that GM is not a way to create higher yields. So uh, really, it's, it's an incredibly successful myth in some ways that the, the biotech industry has promoted over many, many years. And many people just repeat it um, unquestioningly. But it is a myth and it's false. And at that point, I think uh, Jim would like to say something. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, there's some there's some bigger myths to take apart. Um, you know, the, the more important question is who does feed the world? Um, we know it's not really biotech companies, who it is is small peasant farmers. Um, and, and peasant and small scale farmers feed 70% of the world and they do it on 25% of the world's land and, and agricultural land and, and resources. Um, and and that's that's a something to really reflect on. You know, that the real food security and this is a this is what the FAO says. In fact, the FAO says 80% is I think the, the, the statistic they use of the world is fed, fed by small farmers. Um, is 80% of the world being fed by the smallest farmers on, on using peasant agriculture, which is, which is generally speaking, very low input, very um, low carbon. It's not, that's not what's affecting creating climate change. Um, that's the system that works. And um, I, I would really point people towards this book, Who Will Feed Us, which is a report that etc. Group brings out every few years where we track, you know, who, who really does feed the world. Um, the the problem with gene editing and gmos is it's not part of that peasant food web that really feeds the world it's about the industrial food chain and the converse of this is also true the the industrial food chain uses up um 75 percent of, of the agricultural land and resources and feeds almost nobody and so beefing up that industrial food chain through gene editing even if they could push up yields even if they can use digital things is the wrong way to go and um in fact this is about that food, web, that food chain taking over some of the land and knowledge of, of the peasant food web. So we have to step back and see, you know, which is the system we should be supporting. What Jim said is so true. Uh, and I would say that given that the industrial system is not a food system, it is a commodity system. And once you start turning the products of the earth into commodities to do everything under the sun, make biofuel, feed animals. Uh, there was a GM potato, they wanted to use it for making furniture um, because there was a fight against GM foods in Europe. Um, and Percy and I went and protested at that uh, trial site. If we were to add the burning of the Amazon for GMO soya, we are going way beyond 75%. We are talking about a new expansionism. So the combination of the fact that these are reckless technologies, as Jim said, the TNT at the level of the, of the genome own organizing, that it is not about producing food, and the expansionism basically means, first and foremost, you're going to aggravate hunger, Positively, you definitely will not produce more food. The BT cotton example in India is now so well studied and established. Yields went down, they didn't go up. And now all scientists are admitting it's the indigenous seeds, it's the organic seeds, it's the farmer bred seeds, which are the only way you can manage pests and actually increase yields. But the other part of this story is climate change. Just like yield is uh, a result of a complex relationship of multiple traits. Climate resilience is a result of multiple traits. It's a multiple genes and you know, it's a multi-genetic trait. And therefore talking about cut, paste and one, one, uh, one gene will fix this is just at a system level so flawed. At the level of 
um, the last GMOs, they never could do climate resilience. What they do, did was pirate the climate resilient seeds that farmers had evolved of salt tolerance. And we saved these in Nathania, the salt tolerant seeds, the flood tolerant seeds, and then just play, with, and we did a, a report together, et cetera, in Nathania on the biopiracy of climate resilient seeds, on how, because now they're reducing life to digital reading and genomics. They're now using algorithms to decide and play lottery to decide which part of the genome might have the contribution to which trait. And then they talk about lottery tickets, yeah, which will win this patent battle. So we are really in a big gamble. And the problem really is big tech has all the propaganda machine. It has all the censorship machine. Most importantly, it has now hijacked all of the research systems. And our new report in Gates will show that there is no independent research. There's no public research anymore. It's Gates research. What Rockefeller was for the period of, you know, Hitler onwards, standard IG carbon, standard oil IG carbon. What Rockefeller was for that period of the last century, Gates is for right now. And it is the new Monsanto. It is the new Columbus. And we need to be watching and not look very, very narrowly at old uh, separations because this integration is so fast and so complex. So it is an issue of, of power and control and totalitarianism. People are looking too much at authoritarianism in the puppets they have put in power. Those puppets are not in control. The real totalitarians are those who want to control the food we eat. And this is where everyone who cares about democracy and freedom should be looking. Um, and with that in mind, we've talked about feeding the world. We've talked about how the environmental impacts of these foods could have negative effects for generations to come. Once genetic pollution is out in the world, there's simply no recalling it. And that's one of the greatest concerns with gene editing. And now, uh, as of recently, a Nobel Peace Prize was awarded uh, to people who are working on CRISPR technologies. Um, and I was wondering more about how you felt about that and what the future of GE and gene editing technologies are, because as we've, we've talked about these concerns, um, when they were awarded the prize, and I'm reading this, one of the quotes that was said is, this is the year of rewriting the code of life. And that's exactly what many corporations now have in mind. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And what is the role of GE Foods in the future going forward? The simple answer to that is I see absolutely no role, no positive role at all in gene editing in the food production system, crop or animal. Where, where I see a possibility, once we sort out, the, to quote a heading in nature, the chromosomal mayhem that can result from CRISPR gene editing technology, there may be some clinical use for targeting certain diseases. Uh, uh, somatic, I don't mean germline here, but for addressing genetically inherited diseases uh, to help people, certain to target that where it can be really, where you have a real problem uh, to try to solve. But in an agricultural context, they, the, the problem doesn't line the genetics of the plant, and as has been put, said very eloquently by Jim and Vandana and, and, and Jonathan, the, the, all the, the, the desirable traits of a, of a plant or an animal is what we call complex traits. And we now know whether that be yield, better nutrition, pathogen resistance, disease resistant, saline resistant, heat tolerance, you know, all these highly desirable traits that we would like to have in our plants are complex traits. And we now know that complex traits have the totality of the functioning of the genome at their basis. They are what are called omnigenic traits, omni, totality genetics, omnigenics, totality genetics. So to go in and think you can tweak this gene here and tweak that gene there and think you can 
uh, impart on it an enhanced yield or an enhanced resilience to some climate uh, stressor is just total utter fantasy. And more than that, you're going to create a disaster. Why? Because we know that life as a whole, this is again what Vandana was, Vandana was saying, life as a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. And that principle of wholeness is functioning at every level of life from the genes upwards. What that tells you is, is that you, and you cannot predict the functioning of the whole by studying the parts. But also, if you change a part, you're going to have repercussions through the functioning of the whole. That in a totally unpredictable way, because you cannot predict the whole from studying the parts. And so any attempt at enhancing the qualities of our foods in a, through gene editing or even transgenic gene addition technology uh, is bound to fail. You are, you are literally, you're living in a world of fantasy. And it's a dangerous fantasy because the consequences are, are going to be catastrophic. So, you know, what we're going to see is a tremendous amount of hype, right? Especially on the back of this Nobel Prize and everything, right? Like, you know, they, the, the whole rewriting of the code of life, you're going to see all this hype. And Megan has already implied there's all these startup companies and so forth that are, you know, doing things. There are big companies who are often behind these startup companies who, are, who are, have all these incredible plans, but there's going to be a disconnect between the hype and what they can actually achieve, right? This is the classic story of the water efficient maze from Africa, right? What they essentially did in developing this maze is they took indigenous and, and, and farmer saved seeds and they put a transgene in it and then they claimed that their water efficiency was a product of the transgene, right? Which it wasn't. It was a, just a, pro it was a product of the seeds that were bred naturally. And then the, the, the transgene is in there to basically create intellectual property rights and to give the credit to the GMO, right? The transgene that's in there. And you're going to see this huge disconnect. There's going to be a huge amount of money behind this hype, there's going to be a huge amount of hype, but then if you delve properly, carefully, and cautiously into the science, into the research, into the actual results of the in-farmers fields, you'll find that there's next to nothing there. This is the story of traditional GMOs, and it will continue to be the story of gene editing, in my view. Thank you, and uh, I'll jump to Jim now to talk a little bit more about the future of uh, genetic, the gene edited foods as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so at Etc Group, we've been uh, engaged in something called the long food movement, where we're trying to do a 25 year scan ahead of, of what's happening to our global food systems, um, which is necessarily speculative, but it's always interesting to look at what the industry thinks it's gonna be doing in the next 25 years. And um, so there's, and, and looking at that, you see some some very interesting trends which are, which are relevant to gene editing. So the first is, and we've seen this conversation already, the biotech industry, the food industry too, does not want to talk about GMOs anymore. Um, they want to use techniques, and gene editing is one of them, but there are others too, that let them do what they're doing before, mess around with the genome uh, and, and so forth, without using the GMO term. So while we're talking now about gene editing and CRISPR, um, we're going to talk more and more about RNA. We're going to talk more and more about transient expression. Um, there's there's going to be more and more of these technologies. And I think it's important to, to, to not get lost on the individual technologies, but to see we're going to see a lot of genetic engineering approaches, which they'll try to say are non-GMO. So, so that's one thing we're going to see. We're seeing already that the biotech industry is now less interested in changing the organism itself, whether it's the corn or, you know, pigs or whatever, um, and more interested in changing the ecosystem. Um, so we're seeing, you know, gene editing being used for, for genetically engineered pollinators, for genetically engineered mi microbes in the soil, for changing everything around the agro ecosystem. And this is also about not having a GMO at the end of the day. The organism itself may not be engineered, but everything around it will be. And um, 
So we have to really pay attention to that and, and think about how we respond to that because our concerns are ecological, our concerns are agroecological. And if you're modifying the entire agroecosystem, then then that has major significance for the web of life. Um, and of course, we're seeing, as we've touched on in this conversation, that talking just about the biotech industry without looking at data, really agriculture is becoming a data uh, about data. Data is the new soil. Um, and, and this is, you know, the, the large players in agribusiness in the next 10 years are going to be Amazon, Google, um, uh, Facebook even, uh, Microsoft certainly and Gates. So, you know, we have to realize that this, where this digitization happens is, is where, where the change is happening. Um, and those players are trying to change who controls the food system. We're going to see a so-called food system summit next year. And it's really being driven by the Gates Foundation, by the World Economic Foundation. It's going to push uh, genetic engineering and gene drives and many other things. And the good news is, I don't think the world, I don't think people are buying it. We're seeing actually a growth of agroecology, of, of, of supporting peasants who are really feeding the world. So, you know, these are what the industry thinks, but that doesn't mean the future is bound into that. I've been on that because I do think it's so important to draw a distinction between what industry is plotting and what is actually viable and really speak to the power that every single person has to influence the food system based on the choices that you make about what you buy. And we know from some market research that we did with the Nanjimo project last year that 72% of North Americans believe we need to be very cautious about altering our food. And one thing I want to say about that is backing up to some of the myths that the biotech industry has perpetuated. One of the really fundamental ones is that if you are concerned about biotechnology, that you're anti-science or that you don't understand science. And hopefully people are compelled by listening to the scientists in this conversation that that's absolutely not the case. Um, and in fact, true scientific inquiry is all about asking questions. The corporate science that biotechnology companies do is about looking for specific answers in the interest of profits. It's very unscientific, actually, the corporate biotechnology science. So I think it's important to just hold, just to reject that framing, um, because it's one of the ways that the biotech industry really seeks to manipulate the public is to make people feel afraid that they'll be perceived as not smart or not scientific if they don't buy into this. And that's just completely untrue. And I want to even take it a step and challenge us to consider that there are other really valid ways of knowing other than even science. So even though, yes, all of the science is showing that we should be concerned, that it's super chaotic and unpredictable what's happening. We're playing with fire. And also, I just want to represent that the majority of people who are concerned about this technology don't necessarily understand these techniques and the level of depth that we're discussing in this conversation, but there's an intuitive knowing, and I'm speaking to this as uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm a mom of a three-year-old and a six-year-old. I really trust my own intuitive knowing of what is natural and how do I take care of myself and my family and the connection in the web of life. And in this critical moment that we're in on planet Earth with climate change and loss of biodiversity, we have really through a lot of systems based on white supremacy and patriarchy really disconnected ourselves from the source of all life, which is nature. And we are a part of that. And so I just, I, I want to share that interest of helping people feel empowered that if you just feel a little bit like that just seems icky to me, don't like, that's okay. That's valid. You're Intuition is valid. And also, if you want to get into all this of it, just know, as you've seen in this conversation, there is a lot of science that can show that this is not at all precise and that corporate biotech science is not very legitimate science. And it's certainly not something that should go unquestioned. You know, I, I, I feel sad watching the reductionism of the science discourse. After all, IG Farben and Standard Oil working to kill people with new techniques and new chemicals was brilliant science, but it was not the science of life. 
It was the science of death. For 50 years, we were told repeatedly that only chemicals in agriculture is scientific agriculture. In spite of that, organic, biodynamic agroecology kept growing and are still growing. When we started to say there's an obligation, it's not enough to know how to modify an organism. Part of the science is to know what that modification does to the organism and to the environment. That's how we created the discipline of biosafety. That's how we wrote the Article 19.3 in the Convention on Biological Diversity. That's how the Cartagena Protocol was created. Biosafety is a science. The propaganda machine of the biotech industry calls every biosafety expert anti-science. Problem is, they don't have science. Science is to know. Do they know the organism? Do those who make synthetic fertilizers know the soil? Do those who are pushing gene editing and wanting to rewrite the code of life even know what the code of life is about? And I think it is important to see the discourse of reset of the World Economic Forum that has been pushed this month. Part of it is this reset. And I think we should get confidence from the fact that they said they'd feed us with chemical fertilizers and pesticides. We put that aside. Then they came with GMOs. That's dead. Now they're coming with the new GMOs. This will die too, as long as people retain their thinking, as long as people make their choices with informed knowledge. And as far as food is concerned, as Megan said, she said, I trust my intuition. I call it trusting your gut, which is your second brain. And the gut has science, it has knowledge, it has intelligence, and it knows faster than any other lie what's going wrong with the food. Absolutely, thank you for that. And um, I wanna sort of go into some of the solutions as well. Uh, firstly, I wanna ask, what role should labeling play when we're talking about these foods that are spreading so quickly uh, and there's more and more patents on our food? What is the role of labeling in these new crops? Well, I would just say thank you very much for the non-GMO project. Like the label that matters at the moment on this topic is the non-GMO project. Those two people who spend their time trying to understand what's coming. The governments aren't doing this. The industry isn't doing this. They're not providing that information. The, the non-GMO project is doing that on behalf of all of us. And um, I just want to say that's, you know, that's a tremendous disservice. Um, so I think that's, that's a label we, we have to be supporting. At the organic industry uh, or, or the organic um, label is another one that at least has kept GMOs out. And I think there needs to be a conversation about whether organic standards are clearly keeping out these new techniques. Um, that's, that's something that organic movements are trying to talk about. And then we come to the, the other questions of labeling, which I'm sure Megan and others have more helpful things to say about. Megan, do we want to jump to you? Sure. Thank you, Jim, for um, your affirmation of the value of the work the project is doing. And it certainly, um, it certainly feels to us in the wake of having in the United States, the National Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard, it feels like our work is more important than ever because what's been, what's made clear through that legislation is there was a period of time when we first saw prop 37 on the ballot in california we saw some traction in other states of some relatively meaningful mandated gmo disclosure labeling um, and what this federal law did is made all of that illegal it superseded it with this national law that is really pretty meaningless and it's unclear how this, um, how the National Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard will address new GMOs. It appears pretty clear based on the definitions in the standard that um, gene edited products wouldn't be included, although some gene edited products are on their list of bioengineered foods. So I think this kind of backs up your point, Jim, that the, the expertise and the careful watching of this really isn't there. There's some basic misunderstanding or lack of information reflected in how that rule is put together. But either way, we know that there are huge loopholes um, by which companies can avoid disclosing when they contain GMOs, um, one of them being just simply if there isn't detectable modified DNA, then it's automatically not a GMO, even if it was made from a GMO crop or input. So um, unfortunately, in the United States, there's just really no hope of 
meaningful federally mandated GMO labeling, and, and that's why we have created this alternative nonprofit system through the non-GMO project. I think also that uh, the non-GMO project could well need to come to the UK. I think we need, need them to come to the UK and Europe pretty soon, because at the moment there's a massive push within the UK to deregulate gene editing. And with deregulation goes the identity that this product is, is gene edited. Um, with that goes the labelling. We would no longer have labelling if the lobbyists have their way. And um, the same push is, is underway in Europe as well to get rid of the, the GMO specific regulation and also to get rid of the labelling so that, that these products become basically invisible. And um, actually, I, I was talking to a scientist recently who said that um, there is an aspect to deregulation, which I personally had not thought about before. But she said that um, she had actually sat on, on European <coughs> regulatory bodies for GMOs. And she said the, re the chief reason why the industry does not want uh, labeling GMOs and regulation of GMOs as well as the fact that, of course, it doesn't want us to know that we're, we're buying them and eating them. She said there's another purpose as well, which is that regulation forces the companies to actually define their product and say what it does. And because gene editing and GM is such a very messy technique, and because they often end up with something that they didn't mean to end up with, uh, this is not something that the industry can tolerate. Um, it, it wants a completely blank slate. It wants to be able to say that this product does X without actually proving that the product does X. And if the product is shown not to do X, they want to shift and say, actually, this product does YZ instead. Um, in other words, the regulation is, is a definition which the industry doesn't want. It, it wants to remain invisible, remain underground, and just flood the market with these unidentified um, products. Amazing, yeah, and it's uh, it's such a, a huge issue where consumers are not going to know what they're eating, are not going to know um, what they're feeding their children, are not going to be able to make the choice of what type of food system they support, um, and that becomes an ever-evolving question of why do we continue to patent foods? Um, and as much as we could talk about this issue all day long, um, it is a very complex issue and there's a lot of aspects to it. Uh, I'd also like to focus on the solutions because I think it can be overwhelming for a lot of people. So I was wondering if maybe each of you, whoever is feeling compelled to, can share some solutions that people can do or can be a part of. I think that one has to really support the kind of agriculture that we want with our wallets, with our money. Um, I'm very, very fortunate in that I do have agroecological -eco and biodynamic farmers near to where I live. So I can put my money where my mouth is and support that kind of farming. I think it's vitally important. I think that education is important as well um, to reach the young people in schools and teach them where their food comes from, teach them the various ways of producing food uh, so that they're, they're more aware of what's happening to their food and what's happening to the seeds. So uh, I think that's the main thing. Do you want to add something? Um, really, the, clearly, as we've shown you, know, the, 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 there's nothing inherently wrong with our crops. And from our discussion today, that if, if we wanted to improve a crop in some way, the way forward is through natural breeding, because that's what preserves the genetic integrity and brings together the families, the holistic function of genetics that gives you the complex traits that you're after. So the, so the, the problem is not with the, with the plants, but the system that's in place, clearly. And that this is the solution, therefore, is a shift in the system from a high chemical input, intense agricultural commodity driven system to a true agroecological system, one that draws on the knowledge, the local knowledge of the farmer, like, uh, like Jim was mentioning how we you have all, most of the food produced by the peasant farmer. That, that's where the knowledge is. They know, they've got the seeds, 
they have the knowledge uh, on how to grow effectively with security in their area. So this clearly is um, where the emphasis should be. It should be in these, these uh, agroecology, the shift to, to use the agroecology, which is not just growing organically, but taking the agricultural system as a whole, using the knowledge, that the diverse knowledge and the diverse varieties of, of seeds are locally adapted. So for me, th this, is the, this is the solution and, and supporting it locally wherever we are uh, is paramount, uh, as Claire um, uh, inferred. You know, we're, our food systems are going through these twin shocks of um, digitization and this, this technological change and, and also climate and biodiversity collapse and so forth. I fi I'm finding a real interesting um, learning in another shock that we've all been going through and still going through, which is the COVID crisis. Um, and, and in the context of sudden lockdowns and people suddenly finding themselves asking the question, where is my food coming from? In a very sort of short term crisis that's happening and very intense, many people began to reach out to make sure they could grow, get farmers from get food from local farmers. CSAs went through the roof. People started to say, I'm going to plant a garden to make sure there's food growing just outside my, my door. Um, people started to try and make sure they had access to local food. A lot of that has happened at an accelerated rate in the last half a year. And this is people making sure that they're getting their food from places they can trust farmers locally growing connecting to the soil and seed. Um, I think that is an extremely good thing. And um, we have a moment at the moment where we can deepen that, where we can point to that. So this is, this is people are learning in, in a very quick way under this crisis um, to, to get their own food uh, in a way that doesn't require genetic engineering, does not require agribusiness chains, does not require digitization. I'm not talking about buying groceries from Amazon. Um, I think we can, we can, we should together celebrate the ways in which people are relocalizing, rapidly relocalizing their systems under crisis and build that up. I just want to build on that. I mean, of course, I would be remiss to not say that buying on Jumo Project Verified is part of the solution. And I really resonate with what's being shared. One thing that I'm thinking about right now is um, this coming Monday in the States is Indigenous Peoples Day. Some people federally, it's still celebrated as Columbus Day, but an increasing number of us are honoring it as Indigenous Peoples Day. And I I just think there's so much to be learned by looking at traditional ways of producing food and respecting traditional ways of producing food because the commodification of life that is reflected in genetic engineering and extends to the commodification of human beings um, is a paradigm that is inherently destructive. It's not working. And so I, I just want to say again, just speaking to, in addition to being curious and learning about traditional food production, respecting and remembering that there are other ways to do this, I think also just on a personal level, reclaiming your knowledge that you are not a commodity, that you are connected to the web of life and that you have intelligence in your body that will lead you, that will never lead you astray, that will help bring you into connection and to create a future that is healthy for all beings on planet earth. Thank you, and Vandana? Yeah, following up with what the others have said, uh, Michael talked about, uh, you know, the complexity of living organisms and complex traits are the valuable ones. This is what has led to us promoting participatory breeding with our farmers. Farmers are the first breeders. That's where we have the amazing foods. That's where the indigenous farmers and knowledge comes from. And now there's more and more knowledge. They're richer in phytochemicals, measured in weight, they might be less, but measured in nutrition, they are much higher. Another reductionist category is the yield per acre. And in Navdanya, we re redefined it and said, no, we're going to intensify biodiversity, not chemicals. And we measure nutrition and health per acre, and we can feed two times the world by conserving biodiversity, regenerating the soil, and intensifying our crops in mixtures the way they should be. The final reductionism is taking food and turning it into a commodity. 
And that's where we have to create much more intimate circulation. And our work in Navdanya has shown that when farmers are sovereign over their seeds, sovereign over their methods of production and their knowledge of production, and sovereign over the distribution and the market, they are earning 10 times more than those participating in the global commodity system. Global commodity farmers are in debt. They're the ones committing suicide. So we are at a very big watershed for the future of food, the future of humanity. And there's so much to build on. And of course, we should be alert and watch every new trick, as you have said. But they're tricks. And as long as we are aware they're tricks, we'll find the ways to resist them and keep building the right way to grow food and the right way to eat. I got the meeting right. So, so the the issue the issue for me is like is that the food movement is a political movement that many people don't seem to understand perfectly. At least, you know, when you when you buy organic food and local food and non-GMO food, you're participating in a political movement. There's no political party at the head of it, but it is a political movement. And it's a political movement of sovereignty, right? It prizes the ability of people to provide for themselves locally, to do that independently of the center, the central power structures. And you basically are mutually supporting all kinds of other people who are participating in this food movement, even though you don't necessarily realize it. And so what, what we're seeing is the kind of emergence of a political movement that actually has a social and biological logic to it, right? Like, you know, the, the other social movements that oppose, uh, uh, you know, neoliberalism, that oppose commodification, that oppose uh, inequality, they have a certain kind of logic, but the logic is not the same as the food movement. And it, their logic in many ways is deficient. The, the logic of the food system, the logic of the food movement is a truly holistic and self-sufficient set of organizing principles, right? That are contained within that. And we have to understand that we're all part of that system. And if we want to defeat these forces represented by people like Bill Gates, that is where the logic will come from. Thank you so much. And I, I do want to thank everyone for being on this panel uh, here today. You've all shared such incredible insights. And another thing that we can all continue to do is divest from the system uh, with what we're eating, but also where we're putting our money. Make sure that what you are investing in, in your banks, in stocks, in shares, is not something that's destroying the world. Our money speaks words. And we need to make sure that we are voting for a world that is benefiting everyone, including generations like mine. Uh, I just wanted to say if there's uh, any way that people can contact you, please let us know. Maybe we can go one by one because then people can find out more about your work. Uh, I can start with you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, you know, visit the Independent Science News website. That is, that is probably our central hub. We also have a website called the Poison Papers where we talk about the defects of regulation, but that's of chemicals, but that's a separate issue. But yes, thank you for letting me speak on this panel, Rachel. It's been great. It's been great. Thank you so much. Uh, Claire and Michael, where can people find you? Yes, uh, for me, it's gmwatch.org. And people can go onto that website, sign up to our free newsletters, um, contact us if you'd like, and uh, we'll send you our information. Um, well, I don't belong to, I, I help other organizations. I don't have one myself. Obviously, you can search for me on Google um, uh, or any, you know, a browser to link to articles I've helped write for GM Watch and in other areas. And you can search the, you know, the academic literature for our work on um, where we have been highlighting the, the dangers of pesticides. Uh, and so, yeah, really um, search, just generally search for me and, and, you'll, and you'll find all that we do. Amazing, thank you, Jim. Yeah, thank you very much, Rachel. It's been a really interesting and illuminating discussion. Um, you can follow the work that Etc. Group does at www.etcgroup.org. 
Um, and, and likewise, you can sign up for a, a newsletter there that goes out every month or so, um, both in English and Spanish. And we also have materials on that there as well. Um, and uh, there is also a website which we are involved with, which monitors uh, emerging biotech, and it's called SynBioWatch, S-Y-N-B-I-O watch w-a-t-c-h dot org so that's a place where things get posted around not just gene editing but other new biotech techniques so yeah thank you Rachel. Thank you. Megan? Thank you our main website is nongmoproject.org we also have a website that's more focused on the general public um, that's livingnongmo.org and then I would encourage people to watch um, follow us on social channels particularly Instagram. It is currently the 11th annual non-GMO month, and this year we've paired up with Fair Trade because it's also Fair Trade Month, so we're celebrating those events together, and if you check us out on Instagram, you can find out how you can be part of that celebration. Thank you. And Bandana. So the work of Navdanya in India, you can find on navdanya.org. Um, uh, our research and our Education is Earth University at Navdanya and, uh, and our international campaigns at our, are at Navdanya International. And the new report that I was talking about that gets released on 14th will be up at the Navdanya International website. Want to contact me, you can write to earthuniversity at navdanya.net. Amazing. I want to thank you all again for all of your work for trying to protect by diversity, for trying to protect nature, our health, our food. Uh, you've all done such incredible things for my generations and all the generations that are yet to come. Um, so thank you for your insights. Thank you for all of your information. Thank you for your knowledge. It is so greatly appreciated in this time. Uh, and thank you for everyone who watched. I hope that you got something from this, that you were able to take information into your own daily lives and we can go forward to fight for a better future for us all.